we're back with another edition of the Federalist Radio Hour. I'm Emily Jashinsky, culture editor here at The Federalist. As always, you can email the show at radio at thefederalist.com. Follow us on Twitter at FDRLST. Make sure to subscribe wherever you download your podcasts as well. Today, we have a great guest on the program. That would be Samuel Gregg. He's the director of research at the Acton Institute. He's the author of 13 books. He writes about the political economy all the time and has a great new article out in National Review called The Conservative Fight Over the Size of Government, which cuts to the heart of a lot of conversations we have on this show all of the time. So Sam, thank you so much for joining us today. Emily, it's great to be with you and with all the people of the Federalists. So can you tell us a little bit about how you, your argument in this article, because a lot of it is actually just a really good outline of the debate that's happening on the right period. Um, and it tackles Mitt Romney's proposed um, cash, basically uh, cash deposits uh, for parents. But what did you write about in this article, if you could walk the audience sort of through how you approached the issue? Sure. Well, again, thanks for having me on. When I read about the Mitt, ne- Mitt Romney's uh, proposal for a child care allowance, the first thing that came to my mind was, first of all, this is a relatively small, albeit by federal government standards, spending standards, which of course is uh, not a happy standard to use, but it's a relatively small amount of money that would be extra allocation in terms of government expenditures, about $66 billion a year. As you know, that's small change by federal government standards. But what was interesting to me was the furor that broke out about what was actually a relatively small spending increase. And the furor between, on the one hand, social conservatives saying, look, the family is under siege, it's under enormous economic pressure, which has been exacerbated by COVID. We need to directly help the family. Uh, And so they were very complimentary about Senator Romney's idea. On the other hand, fiscal conservatives said, are you kidding? We are already overspending by trillions of dollars. We have trillions of dollars in debt. Uh, The federal deficit is going to expand by about a trillion dollars a year over the next few years. Are we seriously, we as conservatives, seriously proposing more spending? Now, the details of the actual argument about the child allowance policy will continue to play out. But what I think it does point to is something you mentioned, a long and enduring argument that is now breaking out into the open all across the right, which has to do with things like what gets priority, family or our fiscal problems? And on the other hand, what priorities different groups in the conservative movement think need to be moved to the top of the list? Social conservatives are saying we're tired of the family and our issues being put aside for, uh, you know, we, you like to talk to us at election time, but really after that you ignore us. Fiscal conservatives saying, look, we've been arguing for years about the need to reduce government spending, and yet when Republican administrations come to power, they also increase public spending. The last president to substantially reduce uh, the public debt was William Jefferson Clinton, who was not a conservative and not a, a Republican. So. All these issues, I think, point to these deep disagreements now about the role of government and the role that conservatives believe government should be playing in our society. Clearly, some conservatives, social conservatives for the most part, want to see the government doing more. On the other hand, fiscal conservatives are saying, no, we need rather less. And for those people who are both socially and fiscally conservative, of whom I number myself, we're increasingly being asked, do you value the family or not? Do you value the market economy or not? It's time to pick the side. So these are the issues I tried to float, if you like, in this particular article. And given the response it got, I think I hit a nerve. Yes. <laughs> and, you know, it's been really, I think this is actually a really healthy debate because yes. the the argument that's intensifying from people like Orrin Cass and even Tucker, Tucker Carlson is that free markets are fine, but they have to sort of be adjusted to meet an end. And we have to have the family as really the ultimate end. And I wonder what you thought of Senator Marco Rubio and Senator Mike Lee's response to the Romney proposal, and also what you think might be the middle ground between what Senators Lee and Rubio have proposed and what Senator Romney proposed. 
Well, I think uh, one critique that came from people like um, Senator Rubio, who is, I think, a social conservative and more or less a type of fiscal conservative at the same time, uh, he was basically arguing, look, some of these proposals have been tried in the past, and it's not entirely clear that you get what you want from them. So, for example, there are some people arguing that if you increase child allowances, there's some empirical evidence suggesting that it produces an increase in single mothers. Now, I'm not here to condemn anyone's particular choices in lifestyle, but I think it's fair to say that single motherhood is not something that genuinely people should be encouraging, least of all conservatives. So they were pointing out that what you wish for when it comes to the implementation of particular economic proposals, you may end up getting things that you didn't anticipate. Economists call this the, the law of unintended consequences. But in this case, people like Senator Lee and Senator Rubio were saying, look, we do know that there will be some negative effects of this upon the family. So one way I think of trying to square the difference might be more uh, discounts or uh, tax credits when it comes to families for the number of children you have. There are ways of doing these things that don't involve shelling out money directly to individuals with all the negative social effects that this often has. So that's one way in which this debate might be coming to some sort of resolution about, well, if you want to reduce government, and you want to reduce government spending, and you want to help the family, let's reduce taxes. Now, this doesn't deal with the problem that a lot of fiscal conservatives would point to, which is, look, we're still spending more and more money. It's great that you're, re you're reducing uh, taxes on families, we're all in favor of that, but that doesn't deal with the issue of the fact that the federal government is still spending too much money. So even something like a tax credit or an expanded tax credit or a more generous tax credit wouldn't deal with some of these the issues that the fiscal conservatives are pointing to. I would also add to that mix that much of the dysfunctionality that American families suffer from has very little to do with economics. I think a lot of it has to do with uh, the effects of the sexual revolution, uh, uh, breakdowns of social mores, the failure of religious organizations to form people properly in what it means to be a family, what it means to be a father, husband, wife, mother, et cetera, et cetera. And these problems are social pathologies that don't admit of an economic solution, which I suppose is, is part of the argument that's going on here. Social conservatives are looking for economic solutions to many problems which are social and cultural in nature. Now, I'm not denying that the economy has significant implications for social life. Of course it does. But there's, I think, a problem when you start using these types of programs to try and engineer specific social outcomes. And let's remember, we've been here before. This was tried in the New Deal. This was tried in the Great Society. In fact, I would argue it was tried on a mammoth scale during uh, the Great Society programs of the 1960s and 1970s. And I think it's very debatable whether those programs achieved their goals. And I think it's very provable that they ended up doing exactly the opposite of what they were intended to do. You know, this is so interesting to me, and I'm glad you brought up the New Deal, which is also in your article, mm -hmm. because there used to be it's interesting. We're about a decade removed from the Tea Party, um, yes. and we're seeing the conservative movement um, speak in very different terms about the government and approach the government in very different terms. And there is some research about the potential efficacy of the, the Romney plan, um, mm -hmm. and, but, but numbers can only tell us so much. Um, we, we've kind of run this experiment, and what the numbers can't necessarily tell us very clearly, what the projections and the modeling can't tell us um, very clearly is how this will affect culture. Right. So what do you think some of those lessons from the New Deal era are? Because one thing I liked about the Rubio Lee response to Romney is that this actually comes down to incentives um, mm -hmm. and work incentives and the, the crucial role that they play in uh, giving people the, the freedom and the motivation to innovate and to enter the workforce. Yes, I think this is. These are all valid points. Um, one could. So we've heard, for example, some social conservatives arguing that the Romney plan 
uh, would, they, they, some of them have freely admitted, freely admitted that this would increase the number of single mothers. They, they argue, well, yes, I think we have to concede that. But they argue it would reduce the abortion rate. Mm. Now, the problem with making these types of projections is that you really don't know a lot of these things. A lot of this is projections based upon hypotheses. And we've been in this path before where people in the 1930s and 1960s were saying, if we do this, this will happen. Well, this might happen, but a lot of other this is might happen as well. In fact, we know lots of other things will happen, not least because of what you mentioned, this issue of incentives that fiscal conservatives rightly, in my view, point to that when you do certain things with government economic policy, it creates incentives to behave in particular ways, some of which you may have anticipated, but some of which you won't anticipate. And one of the good things about a lot of the quality research that's been done on these areas is that we can predict to a certain extent a lot of the bad things that will start to happen. We do know, for example, that when you start to expand the welfare state, when you start to expand um, government programs, especially those that involve direct grants to particular individuals or families or whatever, there are all sorts of negatives that start to go along with that. It's like the argument for the universal basic income, right? Um, there's no doubt in my mind that whatever the economic merits, which I think are questionable, there's no doubt in my mind that it will create some very perverse incentives when it comes to people's willingness to work, something that social conservatives should be concerned about because social conservatives have rightly emphasized that work is more than just an economic function, that it has profound moral, cultural, and familial positives that we should encourage. So this, these are some of the complex political things that I think are going to have to be worked out. These are some of the complications of some just some basic economic insights, which I think need to be applied to some of these questions. But there is, I think, it, it is also reflective of this broader political fracture on the right concerning the role of government, which I don't think is going to be going away in the medium term. No, and again, I, I think that's a, you know, on, on a sort of 30, from a 30,000 foot view, I think it's a great debate to have and not to sort of dwell in the weeds too much. But I think this question in particular speaks to that broader debate you just articulated so clearly, which is, I wrote about this issue as well. And a lot of the counterpoints I received were that, you know, if, so the extra $300 in a parent's bank account a month or whatever that number is based on how many children they have, is that really going to disincentivize work? And if it does, is it so bad if it disincentive, if, if it takes that parent, you know, from doing extra Uber trips or whatever, it, whatever that extra work may be and gives them time with their children, is that so bad? Now, I wanted to see what your response to that counterpoint would be, because mine would be that you're making a lot of assumptions about how people are going to use their extra right. money on a monthly basis and that they're going to use it responsibly and they're going to use it in a way that benefits their children. What would your point to that be? My response would be rather similar, that you can't predict how millions of people are going to use this $350 for every child below the age of five or $250 a month. Uh, for every child above the age of five between and, and, and up to 16. You just don't know. Maybe there'll be some families that might use it responsibly. Maybe there'll be some families that use it to buy alcohol or drugs or um, spend it on things that have actually no relevance at all to the well-being of the children in their family. You just don't know. That's the problem with these sort of blanket giveaways of money. You can't predict how people are likely to use it. The second thing I think you could say is, okay, well, where does it stop? Mm -hmm. Why not $1,000 a child? Why not $10,000 a child? If your argument stands that this is going to be good and that maybe we should be willing to pay the price, okay, well, where's the upper limit? And in fact, there is no upper limit once you start to go down that path. And you can see this by some of the arguments of people saying, well, no, this is, this is not enough money. We need more money. We need more money. So I, I think it's, it also engenders, I think, a broader problem, which is looking to the state to resolve sorts of questions that I think are really beyond the capacity of 
someone sitting in a wash office in Washington, DC to resolve the, the familial problems of people in Dakota or Texas or some other part of the country. In other words, the, the person sitting in Washington, DC, the person designing the possibly, po policy can't possibly know what's going to be the best fit for any millions of families throughout the country. Maybe there are some families that it's better not to give them extra money at all because we know that in some cases it's going to encourage and facilitate and pay for some highly dysfunctional behavior. So there's all sorts of counter arguments to these, the, the sort of the policy details and the policy minutia that you're highlighting. But it does also come down to this, this shifting mindset about among many conservatives about what government should be doing vis-a-vis -vis culture and some serious, and they are serious, social dysfunctionalities that exist in America today. Something interesting on that point is there's this new impulse to uh, reflexively, and I actually understand it, to sort of reflexively anybody, smear anybody as a libertarian who right. has concerns about either the debt or about, let's say, work incentives or the ethical question of throwing more government money or more government intervention in such a, a personal and intimate institution like marriage or like child rearing. Um, what do you think, do you think part of the fault there lies on, uh, it lays with conservatives who aren't making or who have taken for granted the argument that government intervention is not just about debt, it's actually a moral question of what you were just mentioning that, um, you know, we, we do hear a lot about the debt argument, but I guess I, th I feel like maybe we don't hear enough um, about how government intervention is a, a, a moral, it's a, there's a moral question of what you're doing to the family and what you're doing to parents. Um, and that's something we may have heard, you know, 10 years ago when we were talking about the Tea Party and the morality of government intervention. But is, is that sort of conflict perhaps uh, due in some, in some small or large part to the fact that these arguments aren't being um, made in the most effective terms? Sure. Well, speaking as someone who's a free marketer, but not libertarian, <laughs> there is a difference. There is a difference. Um, I will often point out to people that it's a lazy argument just to dismiss these genuine concerns about uh, an expansionist fiscal state by saying, well, that's, you're a market fundamentalist. You hear that expression a lot as well. Well, if you question using the government to engage in industrial policy or trying to shape family policy, then you are a market fundamentalist. You are a libertarian. You are irresponsible. You're a hedonist. You don't care about people. In fact, you probably hate families, et cetera, et cetera. You, can, you hear that argument coming a lot. And part of it is reflective of the fact that many free marketers, at least in my experience, find it very difficult to get outside the economic box when it comes to arguing about these sorts of issues. One of the great strengths of um, those of us, those people who work in the world of economics and political economy is that they can point to all these things that start to happen when you start using the government in particular ways and say, look, there's a, we have a genuine concern that you're maybe not taking into account what we can show you are some very documented effects of what happens when you go down this path. That's okay, but you also, I think, need to be making a type of moral cultural argument, such as, why is it the case that we're looking to the government to try and deal with some of these deep cultural and social sociological problems? Shouldn't this be something that wider families, local communities, churches, local associations, Aren't these the organizations that are best equipped to try and, try and deal with some of these issues? And isn't it the case that when the state gets into the business of trying to directly deal with some of these problems, it, you have what's called the crowding out effect, right? So the state starts to get involved and what happens? Many of these local associations, many of these churches, many of these local communities, they start taking a lesser and lesser role. Some people will say, well, the state's taking care of it. It's not my problem anymore. In other cases, what's even worse sometimes is that many of these, these institutions of what we would call civil society or what Alexis de Tocqueville called intermediate associations, 
What's worse is when they start becoming the vehicles through which much of this government funding starts to get directed. And when that happens, these organizations stop paying attention to the needs and concerns and problems that are facing many families, many communities, and they start looking for how do I get my program to fit what the government wants us to do? How do I get federal tax dollars? And when you do that, your orientation moves away from those people you're concerned about and your orientation becomes much more upon how do I get that government contract? So you start to see here that a social conservative should say, no, this is a problem. This is a problem because we value a dynamic, rich, flourishing, pluralistic thing called civil society. Uh, and we should not be wanting these programs, however well-intentioned, to crowd out or worse, co-opt many of these organizations of civil society as we try to address some of these real problems. This question might be a little hazier, but I'm wondering what your take is on whether cultivating a sense of regular monthly dependency on the federal government, not the state government, not the local government, but the federal government for help with, again, something as intimate as child rearing um, and for people in a lot of income brackets, not just super low income brackets, mm -hmm. but all the way up through the middle class. If there's something perhaps that is um, less tangible than numbers, but if there's something that we should be concerned about in terms of the, the culture of parenthood in this country, when it comes to the fact that people will be you know, looking into their bank accounts every month, relying on that check from the feds um, to help take care of their children's needs. Is there, is there something sort of um, about creating that sense of dependency on the federal government or that relationship between individual parents and the federal government on a monthly basis um, that should be concerning? Oh, definitely. I think there's a lot to be concerned about that because in the first place, it encourages this very unhealthy trend to centralization, the centralization where we start, everyone starts looking, or at least more and more people start looking to the federal government, to Washington, D.C., as the place that takes care of us, the place that is concerned for us, the place that gives us at least part of our monthly income. That doesn't really sound too much in accordance with the founding fathers of the United States. That doesn't sound to me to be particularly um, evocative of what the United States is meant to be. It sounds a lot more like what we would call a European social democracy, where the central government is intimately involved in everyone's lives with all the dysfunctionality that goes along with that. And to my mind, this is an area where I think social conservatives and fiscal conservatives can certainly find some common ground, right? Because I'm not sure social conservatives should be so happy about people looking to the central government, the federal government, as the first place where we should be dealing with problems. And a lot of fiscal conservatives would be saying, well, this is not just bad economically, it also increases the sense that we look to the federal government at some level for our salvation. Fiscal and social conservatives should be genuinely concerned about that sort of trend, albeit for slightly different reasons, but they should certainly be concerned about this growing centralization and which goes along with a certain degree of dependency on the part of individuals, families and local communities upon the federal government. And we're not even talking about state government here, right? We're talking about the federal government. It seems to me not particularly consonant with the American founding or the American ideals of what America is supposed to be, that we would have a federal government doing these sorts of things. And I would add to that, when you create these mammoth infrastructures under your own terms, uh, when somebody else on the federal level is in office and, and has a different end goal in mind, you're creating the infrastructure to be tweaked to a very different conclusion, perhaps, or right. a very different end goal. It was very surprising to me that this proposal was actually came from somebody like Mitt Romney and then got a sort of warm reception from uh, different sort of sectors of the right, given that, I mean, it, it strikes me as such an obvious 
moral question, um, uh, inviting the state into your relationship with your children, your financial relationship with your children. If I'm playing the sort of reform conservative devil's advocate, um, my question to you in that last answer would be, so what? So what if this is creating a European style social democracy, they've seen some successes, um, maybe they've seen some failures too, but so what isn't the cost of that, uh, you know, isn't that outweighed by the benefit of boosting the birth rate of mm -hmm. boosting parenthood, so what. Well, my answer would be well there is a big what to be to be sewed about if you like, first of all. When you look at the experience of European uh, social democracies in dealing with these issues, by and large, increased child alliances don't result in increase in the birth rate. This has been tried in France. This has been tried in countries like Sweden. Generally speaking, there may be outliers, but generally speaking, it doesn't increase the birth rate. So that's the first thing. The second thing I would say is there is a big problem when we're looking increasingly to government to try and solve problems that government is usually very bad at trying to address. So that's another thing to be concerned about. Uh, a third thing I would say is that in many respects, this is a distraction from some of the very hard work that needs to be done to repair America's social fabric and familial fabric that has very little to do with economics per se and much more to do with some of the deeper long-term problems that uh, you mentioned before. Another thing I would say, and this goes to your point about building up um, institutions, is that, is that once you create these programs, they generally don't go away. They don't go away. What's even worse, and this should concern, this is a big what for conservatives, um, Many of these bureaucracies, as we've seen in the case of the New Deal, as was, we saw in the case of the Great Society, develop their own agendas, their own concerns, their own constituencies that have very little to do with the audience that they ostensibly serve to, serve to uh, try to do help. So for example, many of the institutions that were created by the New Deal, by, I'm sorry, by the Great Society programs, by the 1970s, and this is very well uh, detailed in Amity Schley's book, Great Society, she points out that by the early 1970s, these organizations weren't even pretending to have as their number one concern the audiences, the groups, the marginalized groups that they were ostensibly designed to help. Their number one concern was job security or how much of the federal budget that they received. In other words, they had become completely dysfunctional. As in the nature of bureaucracies, they develop their own agendas, their own concerns, their own things that they're concerned about that have very little to do with the audience that they're trying to help. I mean, many of these bureaucracies, frankly, are about as helpful as teachers unions. They actually do not serve the well-being of the organization, that the people they're trying to help. They serve their own self-interest. Because here's the thing, self-interest doesn't just work in the economy. It also has implications for political life and the life that bureaucracies take on. And bureaucracies that are pursuing their self-interest are, are very difficult to stop and they have a tendency to grow. And it's very, very difficult to get rid of them. And that's something I think social conservatives should be concerned about. How does this entire debate translate into the shinier conversation about big tech, uh, because there are a lot of sort of conversations about Section 230 and about uh, that, that happen in sort of legalese about the weeds of our existing tech policy and how it can be reformed. But in a broader sense, it is really interesting that we've seen this uh, heightened conservative appetite for federal government intervention into the private sector. Do you see most of that as sort of the necessary um, the, the necessary, what is the right word here, cultivation of the free market or the, the necessary regulation of the free market that capitalists should crave and should want and demand in order for it to function in a fair and effective way? Or do you think that in a broader sense, this is something conservatives are, are heading in a dangerous direction by pursuing? Well, you know, that's an interesting question because I think it's fair to say that uh, free marketers and, and conservatives more generally, I think, are quite divided about this because on the one hand, they look at big tech and say, okay, you're a bunch of 
hipster, millennial, progressives, you have a, you clearly have a type of view of the world. You're hiding behind the notion that you're not a publisher, but you are behaving like a publisher. You are censoring people. You are not giving for, uh, equal time, et cetera, et cetera, which I think is all very hard to deny. The question really comes down to, well, how do we deal with this issue? Now, free marketers have traditionally um, been divided about this question because on the one hand, there are those who have argued, well, this is why you, traditionally in the past, we dealt with these types of monopolies with things like antitrust law. Antitrust law was developed um, late 1890s, 1900s, and applied to deal with perceived monopolies, um, the oil, the car industry, et cetera, et cetera. Another, and there are plenty of free marketers today who would say, yes, it, that we, see, we need to be doing the same thing so that we break up monopolies, we allow more competition, et cetera. On the other hand, there are some free marketers who will say, well, yes, I understand that, but why are you assuming that the antitrust authority or the regulator that will be involved in dealing with these problems how are you going to prevent it from being captured by the very industry that it's designed to regulate? And they have a point, right? Because we've seen again and again, many of these uh, antitrust outfits, many of these anti-monopoly outfits, um, you know, they tend to recruit people from the industry that they're regulating. I mean, that makes sense, right? And so what happens is that they tend to get captured by uh, the, the industry that they're supposed to be making sure does not develop into a monopoly or they're supposed to be breaking up. So this is a very hard one for conservatives and fiscal conservatives because, uh, frankly, I can see both sides. And, and I've changed my own mind about this subject several times, as, for example, did Milton Friedman, right? Mm -hmm. Friedman was sort of in the 1940s, 1950s, inclined to think that antitrust was the way to go with some of these issues. But by the second part of his life, he changed his mind and said, no, what we really need to do is, is just to try and make sure that the market remains as open as possible because I'm very concerned that these regulatory agencies that are designed to try and fix some of these problems end up becoming part of the problem. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you know, there's another, another element of all of this there was a case study that played out. We had Ryan Anderson on the podcast ah. last week, and there's an amazing case study that played out with, with his book, which yes. um, Amazon has apparently 83% of the market in book selling in the United States, and they just totally dropped Ryan's book while they also still offer Mein Kampf for some mm -hmm. reason and mm -hmm. a lot of other books, um, and which, is, which is fine. Um, people should have access to that material so we can learn from it. Um, but they're sort of applying these very uneven standards for conservatives that don't get applied elsewhere. But Ryan's book then did really well on Barnes and Noble. Yes. So it, it, are we seeing, you know, with Parler or with the Barnes and Noble case study here, are we seeing that the market actually is capable of handling these situations? We're just kind of living through an adjustment period. Or do you think that, and to add to that, is there, are there actions that would kind of quash the innovation that might address some of these problems naturally and, and more effectively? Um, or, you know, does an 83% market share of, of book sales um, demand some sort of regulation? Sure. Well, Ryan's a friend of mine, and I, I noticed, I saw last week, as, every, as everyone else did, how Amazon decided to pull his book because of its apparently unfashionable views. But what's interesting about that, there's two things you need, we, I think we need to consider. What is the problem here? Is it a monopoly position or is it the fact that Amazon have decided that they are going to be the arbiters of what is reasonable and allowed and polite conversation and what is not? It seems to me that the, first, the, 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 the second part of that is the real problem. The fact that Amazon is is basically taking the role of we are going to be the arbiters now of who gets to see what. And yes, we, it just happens to be the case that we have an 83% monopoly of the book market. Okay, so, I, so is the problem the, mon, the monopoly or the, the 83% or is the problem the fact that Amazon is run by progressives who don't like discussion of certain issues? I think it's clearly the first one, right? The monopoly is the means by which they're, they're pushing this. The second thing I would say is that in conditions of a market where 
no one is enjoying privileges from the state, be it by direct legislation or by regulatory authorities. Markets tend to break down monopolies over time. It's very clear. Um, if you look at the car industry, if you look at the oil industry, um, these things, which were once pretty much controlled by a very small group of people, have, for, for a large, to a large extent, uh, become much more, more competitive. Now, there's a lot of cronyism in those industries, which has not gone away and which needs to be dealt with. But cronyism and these sorts of things is enabled when people believe that they can look to a government regulation to protect them from competition. So the problem there becomes the issue that something is being regulated in the first place, not the fact that <laughs> the crony is seeking some sort of protection. So untangling this mess, I think, is, there's all sorts of ways one can do it. I think that challenging Amazon to say, why is it that Ryan Anderson's book about uh, transgender ideology is verbotum, while Mein Kampf is okay, um, presumably books by Stalin and Pol Pot apparently uh, don't meet your test of uh, being barbaric books, to put enormous pressure on them to explain why, but also to explain to them, you know, you would actually be better off if you just let people buy and sell what they wanted on your website would actually be, you, why are you basically, why are you deliberately antagonizing 50% of the country with a decision which cannot but look like an example of progressives trying to use their economic position to push particular political views, which will provoke conservatives to look to political means to try and fix the problem. So if you see what I mean, it, it, progressives I think are making a huge mistake uh, in terms of their own self-interest. And conservatives are pushing back with measures which I think could, if, if, if not done right, or maybe just implicitly, could end up being extremely counterproductive. Mm, that's so interesting. I, I wanna close by asking you about a tweet from the national correspondent at Slate who pulled some quotes from CPAC um, and put two of them side by side. He pulled, quote, capitalism has lifted more people from poverty to prosperity than any idea. Capitalism works. That was from Senator Rick Scott of Florida at CPAC on Friday. 15 minutes later, Senator Josh Hawley of Missouri said, I would start by breaking up the big tech corporations, break them up in the name of the rule of the people. What's your take on that? Do you think that highlights, um, this is sort of what your whole essay really gets at, but do you think that highlights an impossible divide between somebody like Rick Scott and Josh Hawley? Or do you think that there is a way for conservatives to bridge what uh, this, this national correspondent for Slate identifies as a gap? Well, there's certainly a gap and I'm not sure it's bridgeable right now. What I do think is healthy is for conservatives to have full and frank debates about these sorts of subjects rather than just simply shouting at each other. Because I found, so for example, I've debated Orrin Cass in different places about these sorts of issues. And that's, but that's precisely, I think, what needs to be happening so that the issues are clarified in people's minds so that the rhetoric gets dialed down, so that we start to understand what is at stake and what is not. And so we start to identify what are the real problems and what are the false problems. Capitalism is not the problem here. The problem to my, so I think Senator Scott is absolutely right. Capitalism is this wonderful economic system that has diminished poverty at a faster rate than any other economic system in history. What Senator Hawley is pointing to, I think, is the fact that the progressives are exercising a cultural hegemony at the moment, which they and they're using, if you like, private means to shut these things down. It should be possible for someone like Senator Scott and Senator Hawley to come to an agreement about what's really the problem here. And the problem here is not the economy per se, the problem here is the way the left understand culture, and frankly, I think they understand it much better than most conservatives in terms of its saliency in driving debate, and the need for conservatives to start taking these cultural side of things much more seriously and not looking for economic solutions or, for that matter, industrial policy solutions to try and fix some of these problems. So a debate that clarifies what is really the problem here, I think, would quickly come to the conclusion, it's not the economy per se, it's not capitalism per se, 
It's the way the left are behaving. Mm. You've been listening to Dr. Samuel Gregg. He's the research director at the Acton Institute. He has spoken and written extensively in his 13 books on questions of political economy, economic history, ethics and finance, and natural law theory. He has an MA from the University of Melbourne and a doctor of philosophy degree in moral philosophy and political economy from the University of Oxford, which I think explains why his insights today were so helpful. Dr. Gregg, thank you so much for joining us today. Emily, thanks for having me on, and thanks to all the listeners for being here. Absolutely. You can also read his essay in National Review. It's called The Conservative Fight Over the Size of Government, and it's excellent and helpful. You've been listening to another edition of the Federalist Radio Hour. I'm Emily Jashinsky, culture editor here at The Federalist. We'll be back soon with more. Until then, be lovers of freedom and anxious for the fray.